Welcome to worship at the College United Methodist Church here in Philomath, Oregon. We are continuing our online worship every Sunday. Our worship is posted early on Sunday morning and you can access it anytime after that on our YouTube channel or through our Facebook page. A reminder that this is the final Sunday that you can donate to the quarter offering fund and have it go to the Philomath Community Gleaners. The Philomath Community Gleaners access food from farmers and from grocery stores and help provide that food to people that are in need. Today we're excited because we have Reverend Wayne Lavender reading our Old Testament scripture this morning. Reverend Lavender is the Executive Director of Foundation for Orphans. He came and spoke to us several months ago and we will hear more from him in the coming weeks about his organization. Now we are ready for worship and let us begin our worship with prayer. Gracious God, guide and direct our worship this day that it may be pleasing to you. Send down the spirit of your presence that we may feel you present with us in every home or any place that we are worshiping online. Guide and direct us through the next week that the things that we learn and experience today would be a source of strength to us in the coming days ahead. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. I have a very special guest that's come to help us here at the Good News Corral today. He comes all the way from across the pond. And if we call his name, he might come out and talk with us. I hear he really loves his name. His name is Freddy Fantastic the Third. Everybody shout real loud. Freddy Fantastic! Yo, what's happening? Let me hear you say my name again, everybody. Shout Freddy Fantastic really loud. Oh, uh, Freddy? Boy, do I love my name. It just sounds so pretty. My full, beautiful name is Freddy Fantastic the Third. I have come today all the way from England to talk about how wonderful I am. I thought you were helping us with the Good News Corral. Good News Corral? What's that? Wait, let me guess. I know the good news is God loves Freddy more than anyone else because he is the best creation he ever has and ever will make. No, that's not it. God loves all of us the same. We are all created so God can love us. I really doubt that God loves you as much as me. Look how awesome I am. And look at how plain you look. Now, that wasn't nice of you to say. May not have been nice, but it's true. Now, stop talking about me like that. Seems to me you have too much pride in your heart. Maybe you need to be more humble. Maybe you need to go shopping for some better clothes. Let me check the clothes I brought to see if they might make you look a little better. Okay. Freddy doesn't seem very humble, does he? I think we need to teach him the good news. I'm back! And I don't have anything that will make you look half as good as I do. Wow! You really needed to learn how to be humble, don't you? That brings us to the, our good news for the day. God loves a humble heart. The opposite of a humble heart is a prideful heart. That is someone who thinks that they are better than anyone and they consider everyone else on a lower level. Pride is a bad thing to have in your life. The Bible teaches against it and we will learn why pride is bad and how we can avoid that altogether. Philippians 4.13 promises us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if we are strengthened by Christ, we need to remember that without Him, we are weak. So humility is a very important thing. I think we need to remember this week to be humble and not think we are better than anybody else. Don't you, Freddy? I guess you're right, Clarence. Maybe I'm not so fantastic after all. Can you forgive me for acting so prideful? Sure, Freddy. No problem. I forgive you. And remember to be humble this week. Remember Philippians 4.13. That's all for today, folks. Bye! Bye.
and peace to you. My name is Wayne Lavender. I'm the executive director of the Foundation for Orphans. I'm a good friend of your pastor, Pastor Jim. Jim and I have known each other for about four years. I spoke in your church back in January and I'm delighted to read the scripture lesson this morning. This morning's scripture lesson from 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is David and Goliath, their speeches prior to their battle. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The text tells us, reads, The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you bow with me as we go together before the altar of God in prayer? Jesus, your humility prevented many from recognizing your kingship. Your meekness confused the arrogant, hindering them from grasping your purpose. Teach us to model after that example, to subject our human natures to humility. Grant us with a natural inclination to never view ourselves as greater than anyone. Banish all lingering sparks of self-importance that could elevate us greater than you. Let our hearts always imitate your humility. Let us be always ready to take up our cross and to follow you. Father God, 
we are far too often influenced by what others think of us. We are always pretending to be either richer or smarter or nicer than we really are. Prevent us from trying to attract attention. Don't let us gloat over praise on one hand or be discouraged by criticism on the other. Nor let us waste time weaving imaginary situations in which the most heroic or charming or witty person present is us. Show us how to be humble of heart. Father, this morning we present to you our families, our neighbors, our friends. We ask for your presence in each of their lives. We ask for healing when it is needed, and we ask for your presence and grace wherever it is lacking. Lead us forward now in our worship that it may be for your glory and that it may be pleasing to you. We pray these things in the name of the one that taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Maggie came home one day with a raggedy, raggedy Ann. She said, Mama, look what I found in the neighbor's garbage can. It had a missing left arm and a right button eye hanging by a thread. She carried it gently up to her room and laid it on her bed with her other dolls. She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She sees the diamond in the rough and makes it shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Twenty years later in a shelter on 18th Avenue, Seventeen-year-old girl shows up all black and blue With needle tracks in her left arm almost too weak to stand She says I'm lost and I need help as Maggie takes her by the hand And says come on in She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She sees the diamond in the rough and makes it shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. If you called her an angel, she'd be quick to say to you, she's just doing what the one who died for her would do. Love the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She sees a diamond in the rough and makes it shine like new it really doesn't take that much a willing heart and a 
tender touch If everybody loved like he does There'd be a lot less broken ones Our scripture reading this morning is going to come from 2 Corinthians in chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. It is necessary to brag, not that it does any good. I'll move on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was caught up into the third heaven 14 years ago. I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. God knows. I know that this man was caught up into paradise and that he heard unspeakable words that were things no one is allowed to repeat. I don't know whether it was in the body or apart from the body. God knows. I'll brag about this man but I won't brag about myself except to brag about my weakness. If I did want to brag, I wouldn't make a fool of myself because I'd tell the truth. I'm holding back from bragging so that no one will give me any more credit than what anyone sees or hears about me. I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I've received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word that we might understand its meaning and that we might live out its purpose. There was a work crew that had been working on a construction site for about a week when the company hired a new man to replace someone that had been hurt the day before. Now this new man, he was broad-shouldered. He was a powerful young man. He was a good worker, but he was also very annoying. He was always bragging that he was stronger than anyone else at the work site, and he especially made fun of some of the older guys that worked there. And finally, one of the older workers had had enough, and he said, Sonny, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? I will bet a week's wages that I can haul something in a wheelbarrow over to that outbuilding over there that you won't be able to haul back. And the arrogant young man smiled and said, You're on, old man. Let's see what you got. The old man reached out and grabbed the wheelbarrow by the handles and then turned to the young man and said, Okay, hop in. That young man typifies much of how the world thinks about life. The world believes that power and wealth and position are all that you need in life. The world believes in the survival of the fittest that the man with the most might and the most money and the most power 
will win. One man once observed the battle isn't always to the strong, but that's where you put your money. And that does make sense. The battle isn't always to the strong, but that is where we usually put our money. That is until you get to Scripture. When you open the pages of the Bible, everything changes. Time after time in Scripture, you find the little guy beating the big guy. You have Moses walking into the court of the most powerful ruler of the day, and his only weapon is his walking stick. You have an inexperienced leader named Gideon facing off against thousands upon thousands of ruthless warriors with an army of only about 300. You have a shepherd boy named David going into battle against a hardened giant of a man with nothing more than a sling and a stone. Again, and again and again in Scripture, the little guy beats the big guy. Might and power and possession mean nothing. Because those little guys serve God. And God is bigger than anybody else. One of my favorite scenes in an action movie is when the good guy... I think it was a very young Captain Kirk in Star Trek faced off with a bunch of bad guys. And one of the bad guys sneers, hey, farm boy, maybe you can't count, but there are four of us and one of you. And Captain Kirk says, well, you better go get some more guys so it can be an even fight. That's how it is in Scripture. The bad guys swagger out against God's people and brag that they're going to destroy them. And God just smiles and says, you better go get yourself a couple of more armies and make this a fair fight. Back in 2 Chronicles, we're told the story of the king of Assyria named Sennacherib, who comes sweeping down out of the north with this undefeatable army. He's beaten nation after nation, and now he's coming up against Jerusalem, and he surrounds Jerusalem with the intention of bringing Jerusalem to its knees. He stands at the wall of the city, and he begins taunting the people of Israel, saying, Do not let your king Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him, for no god of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my fathers. How much less will you, your God, deliver you from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my fathers destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? And God just smiled and sent down one angel. And before the night was out, 185,000 of Sennacherib's best soldiers lay dead on the ground. Sennacherib was forced to turn home in disgrace, and then his own sons assassinated him while he worshipped in his temple. And God defeated Goliath with a tiny little shepherd boy named David. The Bible's message here is this. The little guy who trusts in God can whip anybody else on the block because God is bigger than anyone else. It says in Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, who can be against us. Thus, when Paul writes that, that God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness, that causes Paul to conclude, when I am weak, 
then I am strong. So how do we equip laity and clergy to transform individuals and communities and the world by being weak? According to what we've seen in Scripture this morning, we are already equipped. We already have the power. We already have the knowledge. We already have the most important tool that we need, and that is the support and the presence of the creator of the universe. This is such a powerful truth that we find great comfort in it. We sang an old gospel hymn that says it this way, I am weak, but thou art strong. Keep me, Jesus, from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. There is power to be found in walking with Jesus. There's a power to be found in living close to God because I am weak. He is strong. Now that truth, that truth that I am weak forces me to do something I wouldn't do if I were strong. That hymn says, I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk. Where? Close to thee. My strength in life only comes from my walking close to Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 promises us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I gain his strength. I gain his power. I gain his ability to deal with all the difficulties in life. And I gain his strength only if I am willing to walk close with him. It's kind of like strength training. How many of you have ever done strength training? I've done enough strength training to know that I don't know what I'm doing. When I was in school at Perkins theological seminary down in Texas I was staying in an RV park and they had an exercise room and I got this idea that well as long as I'm going to be down here for a month I'm going to go in here and I'm going to work out on these weight machines at the end of the month I'm going to be in very good shape but by the end of the week I was not able to walk in order for for me to be successful in strength training, I needed something else. I needed a trainer. I needed somebody to help my training so I didn't do the stupid things that I did that hurt my back. And when it comes to our spiritual strength training, many people think they can get by with doing that by themselves. They don't believe that they need a trainer. They end up either hurting themselves or getting less strength than they would have had if someone had been there to guide them. And God says, let me be your trainer. In Psalm 29, David declares the Lord gives strength to his people. That is, that's a promise that comes directly from God. He is offering to be your strength trainer. But we tend to live as if God needs us, not the other way around. We tend to believe that God needs our time, our talent, our treasures in order to accommodate and pass on his kingdom. We'll believe God depends on us far more then we depend upon him. We think he just couldn't do it without us. But if God is not impressed by the biggest, baddest bad guys on earth, he's certainly not going to be all that impressed with our puny efforts. Now, and this is very important. 
we can't take this concept and twist it around to where we use it as an excuse not to do anything. Yes, God can handle it. And he can use us any way he pleases. But that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to be a part and to train. What it boils down to is we cannot ignore the opportunities that God presents to us time after time when we are presented with one of those broken ones and it's up to us then. We are at bat. Then God puts us up to the plate and then God chooses to use us. That is not the time to turn to God and say, okay, God, now tell me the right things to say. We should learn the right things to say ahead of time. Lisa's song had these lyrics. She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She sees the diamond in the rough and makes it shine like new. It really doesn't take that much. A willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. But you have to be ready. And we can't do it on our own. We can't expect God to do it for us. And we can't expect God to suddenly give us all the answers when the time comes. And probably most important of all, if we do train, if we do try and learn what to do and what to say, and then those opportunities come and God directs us, and we end up doing a pretty good job talking about God's kingdom to a lost soul, then, then is when we need to remember that God is the one that did it. And all of our training was just for us to learn how to maybe get out of the way and let God work through us. People say, God will find a way. Well, God can't find a way if I'm in the way. In 2 Corinthians, we find that Paul was tempted with this feeling. He said to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surprisingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, I think it is pretty easy to picture Paul getting conceited. I mean, the man was a legend. Whenever he spoke, large crowds of people gathered and they were convicted of the truth of Jesus Christ. He started a number of new churches throughout Greece and Rome. He knew the Old Testament scripture backwards and forward. He wrote half of the New Testament. And on top of that, according to what he tells us here in Corinthians, God had given him a vision where he actually was in paradise and saw and heard things that were so amazing and so wonderful, he couldn't even speak about them. I mean, who wouldn't suffer a little bit of pride if they had accomplished that much for the kingdom of God? And that pride could have hurt Paul's ministry. It could have gotten in the way of what God wanted to do through Paul. Paul's pride would have gotten in God's way, so God sent a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment him. We never know because Paul never tells us what it was, but, you know, that does seem kind of mean. Why would God do that to Paul? God did that because Paul's pride would have made him think God was weak and Paul was strong. It would have made him believe that God needed to do things Paul's way rather than the other way around. It was important for Paul's vision to be God's vision. The great ancient Irish ballad we're going to sing says, Be thou my vision. It's a good thing to remember. You and I are weak, but God is strong. And we need to then make 
his vision our vision for if we don't remember that then we end up doing wrong because we get in the way and we won't give God the room he needs to work in our lives so we need to remember that we're weak we need to remember that for three reasons number one because we are weak and number two because if we don't we'll risk falling into the temptation of pride but number three if we don't remember that we're weak we will miss one of the greatest truths in Scripture, that the strength of God's kingdom is built on weakness. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It is the universal truth of Christ's kingdom. The strength of Christ's kingdom is built on weakness. And you have to look no further than the cross to see that it's true. In 2 Corinthians, we're told that Jesus was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Christ built his kingdom on the weakness that he experienced on the cross. It would have been so much easier for God to just lean through the clouds and make the world perfect, to wipe it clean of all sin. But God didn't do it that way because in order to bring us salvation, Jesus had to come down and become weak. As Philippians tells us, he had to set aside his divinity and humble himself, making himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, becoming human and humbling himself even to death on a cross. The world looks on this biblical truth and they just can't understand it. Why allow himself to die in weakness? Why die in this helpless and humiliating way? He's supposed to be the King of King and the Lord of Lords. He's God above all gods. He has all the forces of heaven at his beck and call. But as Jesus told Pilate, you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But Jesus was not going to buy my salvation and your salvation by force. The constant message throughout the Bible was that in order for us to be forgiven of the guilt and the shame of our past, someone had to die. Again and again in the Old Testament, worshipers needed to bring sheep and goats and a bull or some other living creature to the temple to be sacrificed for their sins a sacrifice was needed so that even though they deserved to die for the guilt of their sins something could be made to die in their place they were pointing forward to the time when someone would make that choice and allow themselves to die in our place that someone was god he set aside his godhood and took on the form of a man and gave his life as the ultimate sacrifice for my sins and for your sins. On that cross, Jesus became weak so that we could become strong. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen
glad that you chose to worship with us this day. And we hope that the time that you spent in worship with us has been fulfilling and has drawn you closer to God. I want to invite you to come along for our Tuesday check-ins that we post right here on YouTube as well as our Thursday Bible studies. Also, don't forget, we are ready for some questions. In just a few weeks, we're going to be starting our town hall meetings on Tuesday. That's going to involve me and some of the leaders in the church where we're going to be able to answer questions presented by the congregation. I hope that many of you will be able to join us by Zoom. And for those of you that are not able to join us, we will be recording these town halls and we'll be able to uh, have them available on our YouTube channel. Once again, we hope that what you receive today in your worship will be a source of strength and courage for you this next week. And now may the love of God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, may the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and stay with you until we see each other again. Amen. Shine.